Okay, so we might get started. So before we start, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands around Australia, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. Ashley Smith. I'm a Dementia Research Development Fellow at the University of South Australia. And I'm also the co-chair of the Accelerator Group that put this webinar on today. Um, and before we start the webinar, I'd also like to thank the NHMRC, National Institute for Dementia Research, and particularly Dr. Lynn Philipson, who's been instrumental in organising the NNIDR webinar series. And I'm thrilled to be given the opportunity to chair this series today. So without further ado, it gives me pleasure um, to introduce Sam Reese's Chief Science Storyteller, Dr. Hannah Brown, to deliver today's webinar. So Hannah is a su highly successful research scientist, was one of the inaugural superstars of STEM. So after a, a successful academic career, Hannah now leads the Storytelling, Communication and Development Unit at South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, Samri. She believes in creating a clear and consistent narrative engaging broadly with consumers, authenticity, integrity, and humor as key ways to effective communication. So today she's going to talk to us all about finding your audiences and communicating with them. So we would really like this webinar to be interactive. Um, we expect Hannah to speak no longer than 30 minutes and we hope that um, each of you will um, put some questions in the question and answer as well as use the chat function um, on your Zoom. So I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask Hannah to share her screen um, and lead us in this webinar. Alrighty. I'm going to just make the assumption that everybody can hear me. All good. Yeah, all good. All right, that's good because I can't see anything and I can't hear anyone. So. Um, thank you very much, Ash, for the opportunity um, to chat with everybody today. Um, and like Ash says, it really is, um, it really is an opportunity to um, have a two-way discussion. I think um, what's really important about conversation and about speaking and about um, identifying and communicating with your audience is listening. Um, when I was a much younger person, my dad used to say, Hannah, you've got uh, two ears and one mouth, use them in that ratio. Um, and I think that that's actually a really important lesson when you're thinking about um, how to communicate uh, with an audience in science. Um, and it, I, I think it speaks to how important it is to actually think about listening first and, and listening always um, when you're thinking about uh, engaging with people. So um, a bit like Ash, um, uh, I also think that um, acknowledgement of country is incredibly important um, and it's incredibly important to Samri. Samri has the largest group of Indigenous researchers in the country um, and so here at Samri we acknowledge the Ghana people, um, the people of the Adelaide Plains as the traditional owners and custodians of the land here at Samri um, and it's important because we do have a very strong Aboriginal health equity theme here at Samri but also because Yesterday was the last day of Reconciliation Week and yesterday was the, the anniversary of the celebration of the handing down of the, of the Mabo decision. So I think that, um, that these things are very important and things that should be considered even when you are communicating with any given audience. So I thought I'd try and cover um, a few things today. 30 minutes isn't long and I did put a little disclaimer at the bottom that says, this is actually a one year course that I teach. Um, so we'll do our best to get through it in 30 minutes. Um, but if I you do have questions. Up, Hannah, um, yeah. I can't actually see your screen. So ah. is you able to, are you sharing your screen right now? Good question. Where is my thing? Yeah, so down the bottom, you should have a share screen option. No, I'm not sharing it. That's why you can't see it. There we go. There we go. Thanks, sorry. Everybody. Take it away. There we you haven't missed anything. Um, but now it explains why I can't see you. Um, <laughs> before. Um, but I can't see the question. So if you do think, if there are things um, that are important as we go, let me know um, and just interrupt Ash, that's absolutely fine. There's nothing that can't be interrupted. I should be good with my spot, despite being a bit jet lagged. 
Um, so we'll try and get through a little bit about who is your audience, um, where your audience are and how to reach them, and then what you should say when you find them um, today. But this is a lot to cover in 30 minutes, and so it's probably just an introduction to any one of these things. But my contact details will be there at the end. So if you did just want to reach out with a question, that's absolutely fine. And hopefully your media and communications team can answer all the questions I can answer, but you're absolutely welcome to reach out to me anytime, either on social media or, um, or by my, I put my personal email address in here so you can chase that down. Okay. So I thought I should just, Ash, kind of introduce um, what I do, um, but I am the Chief Science Storyteller here at SAMRI. Um, I've been here 14 months. Um, and so in that role, I am the Director of Communications, Marketing, Fundraising and Development here at SAMRI. Um, and I sort of, I was thinking a bit about exactly what my role looks like um, and exactly what a role looks like in communications. Um, and it really is everything from like an all staff email about the bathroom's not working through to like an email to the PM's chief of staff about something that's happened or an upcoming visit. It could be a tour of a leader in philanthropy, someone who's contributing millions of dollars here at Samri and thinking about what the story is for them right through to a kindy tour. We have a kindy tour coming through next Wednesday. So it really is very varied. Um, but what's really great about that is that I get to refine the stories of Samri on a really regular basis and get a lot of opportunity to practice them. And I think that those are really key messages in thinking about who your audience is and what you might be telling them. Um, from a scientific perspective, I know that evidence is important in science. So I do have a PhD in reproductive medicine. I did two international po postdocs. I ran my own lab in Australia and I do have a bunch of communication training as Ash mentioned. But um, I guess what led me away from, from traditional academia and towards comms was really just a passion for turning science into action. I felt like my science kept getting stuck in the media office at the university and I thought that the best way to get it out was to be the change I wanted to see in the world. So um, that's exactly what I did. So why are we, I guess, even having this conversation? You're probably all, you know, it's probably no shock to anybody, I think, that the things you do are immensely valuable. Um, they're valuable to you, but more than they're valuable to you, they're valuable to the rest of the world. And obviously lots of, I mean, if you're funded by the NHMRC or the ARC or actually many people, it's paid for by the taxpayer. So the least we can do is, is to give back to the person who's paying for the research, not unlike the way we report to the NHMRC or ARC, we can report back to the taxpayers, the people who pay for us to, to do the research and let them know what we're up to. And obviously, if it gets to the right people, it obviously it stands the very best chance of, of having an impact or of being successful. And I guess the other the thing we, we spend a lot of time talking about is that the internet is filled with myths and rubbish um, and that we have the opportunity as scientists to, to, to not let that be a thing and to contribute in a positive way so that people are less bombarded with myths and rubbish and, and hear from trusted sources like us. So um, I think when we think about audiences, you, we, we're immediately, you know, guys work on demel dementia and Alzheimer's and in all honesty, I don't know the ins and outs of what, what all of you do, um, but I do know the area in which I'm familiar with the area in which you work. Um, and so, you know, it would be, it, it might be immediately clear that the people that you are, um, that your immediate audi audience is people with Alzheimer's um, or with dementia, but obviously um, that's just one small target audience for what might be a huge array of audiences. And I think particularly in, um, in a research area where um, the people who need the information might not be capable of processing the information, it leaves you in a really interesting space in terms of identifying who might be best to speak to, you know, who's acting on behalf of the people that you, um, that you are working for, that maybe them in early years and other people in other years, but thinking about that is really important and thinking where your message is specifically targeted at what time is critically important to the success of any message that you derive um, getting to the right person. So there's obviously older people, older Australians in this case, but I think the people that surround, the village that surrounds um, any person with dementia and Alzheimer's is probably incredibly important. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about communities and villages in a minute, but obviously working out ways to interact 
um, with the people who surround people with Alzheimer's and dementia might be a group of people that is important, that you deem really important for you to interact with. But there are lots of other audiences and ones that you may think about frequently, ones that you might not, um, ones that you think about actively tailoring your message for and ones that you perhaps haven't considered. Um, obviously, these blokes um, are quite important to think about tailoring your message to on, uh, um, on the occasional basis or, um, or often, um, perhaps not directly to the Prime Minister, but um, Greg Hunt is particularly interested in this space. He's visited Samri um, and South Australia twice in the last 12 months to talk about dementia. Um, and so this is something that, that he's very passionate about. He continues to now be, he's again, the Federal Minister for Health. And so he's someone that you should be thinking about. And the other bloke used to be um, the Minister for Ageing and that was on the front bench. It's no longer on the front bench. And this guy here, another white bloke, um, is, the minister, <laughs> is the Minister for Ageing. I'm not sure what his name is, but I know that it's him. Um, he might be someone that you may also want to reach out to and think about tailoring your message for um, because I'm sure that he's particularly interested in the types of research that's happening in this space. And then, then there's obviously all of the potential health and allied health professionals that you may be designing um, interventions or information for. And I think what's really important to, to recognise, particularly in this space, is that it's not particularly, I don't think, when I think about dementia and Alzheimer's, I think it's fairly unlikely that you will, you may develop a drug, but I think it's unlikely you'll develop a technology. So you'll fit into these boxes of, I think more likely than not, lots of the things that will happen in this space will be informational knowledge based. It will be about changes in behaviour. It will be rather than selling or marketing a tool, it will be um, selling and marketing information. And so that makes this even more um, important um, in your space because there are so many people to talk to and the allied health professionals are, are people that you really need to think about tailoring your message to, particularly, you know, in, in ageing where lots of people are regularly seeing lots of these people, having them all on board and having them know what your message is and why it's important to the people they're seeing is really important. Obviously, you might want to reach back to the NHMRC or the ARC, or this just represents any funding body at any time, but the way that you tailor your message for them and how successful you have been or what the barriers are is really important. And this applies both to communicating your discoveries and communicating the, the grants and, and applications that you're writing. Um, I think I can't see much of that, but I think that that's scientists. And obviously, how you communicate with them is really important too, because I think that um, you know, at least in the, the, my knowledge of the Alzheimer's space is that the, how science is communicated in this, in this space, particularly in Australia, is it's not regulated, but there have been some strong conversations around um, what cures look like and, and where exactly we're at and how to communicate responsibly in this space. So how you communicate with other scientists and how you communicate in general are really important in this space. Obviously, there's traditional media. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, in a minute, about the importance of, of reaching them um, in a meaningful way and the kind of um, space that they take up and the, the, the reach that they have and communicating with them is still probably, um, in terms of getting your message out, one of the most important places to, to get your message correct. Um, young people, I think that you don't necessarily um, you don't necessarily always think of young people as people that you want to communicate with in this space and ageing, but, you know, I was thinking back about that, you know, actually, you know, I know Ash from a long time ago and we've been friends a long time and I know that she's doing some really beautiful stuff working with very young people and, and educating them about what, what dementia and what ageing looks like. And so thinking really broadly about your audience is, is incredibly important and young people might fall into that. Obviously, anyone with money... Um, thinking about how you might communicate with philanthropic organisations and donors and just wealthy people who pop in through your institute or who, who you know or who might be looking for a tax break or tax um, opportunity. I didn't think about this anywhere near as much as I do now when I run a fundraising team uh, where we're always thinking about how we, how we talk to these people and their interests are often very different to the interests of lots of other groups and I put charities here too, because obviously they often give out a lot of money. There are a lot of um, non-for-profits and foundations that 
are always looking to give away money to research and, and you are those people, you know, when you put a dollar in a, um, in a donation box anywhere, um, those people are actually raising money for people like you and it's important to remember that and think about how you communicate with them. So this is just a few um, types of audiences, but, and there, there are many, the ones that you have will be different to the person next to you, the ones that you have today will probably be different than the audiences you have after your next discovery, at the time you write your next application. But it's important to constantly be thinking about how you work with these people, how you communicate with them regularly and how you polish up your story, ready to tell them when you do have a good one to tell. And I think that's what I said here, that, that there are many audiences, it's likely to change and, and each audience needs something tailored to them. You know, it's, it's not enough to polish up your 60 second pitch, um, to have your elevator pitch ready and then give it to the wrong person. You know, your elevator pitch for the Prime Minister is very different than your elevator pitch for a philanthropic organisation or a group of kindy students. And you kind of need, need to be ready with all of them because you often only get a very short opportunity to make a good impression with the thing that's most important to you. And making sure you nail that the first time, every time is, is immensely important. And so these people are not hard to find. If you don't often meet the Prime Minister or you don't meet the Health Minister or you don't meet with philanthropic organisations, these groups of people or, or you know, the community, they're all around and they're easy to reach. And I have got some slides that sort of tell you who's who and, and where they are and give you some, some tips on, on how to reach them appropriately. Are there any relevant questions, Ash? Do you want me to stop? There's no questions that have come through yet, okay. um, but please feel free to add your questions um, in the question and answer area or simply in the webinar chat, uh, but nothing just yet. Okay, perfect. I'll get going. All right, so I thought I'd start with a little on where are your audience, um, and I think that this is important because Unfortunately, you can't just target them all with one little post. Um, you can't reach everybody um, very quickly um, and easily, but it's, it isn't hard to reach out and reach your specific target audience with, with the right information. So I thought I'd drill down on some actual data and some facts based in Australia. This, lots of this information comes from um, eight, every two years, there's a media consumer survey um, created by Deloitte, um, big consulting firm that look at the utilisation of, of media and how people are engaging and where they are and what changes in behaviour are happening and those kind of things. And so lots of this comes from there. And, and it's actually lots of the surveys are done by the Bureau of Statistics. So it's, it's, highly, um, it's highly trustworthy data, which I think is different to lots of the other reporting that happens, particularly around social media and, and advertising, which is a little less trustworthy. Um, so I thought, you know, firstly, I guess, contrary to what the world's telling us and what Facebook's probably telling us, um, lots of people still engage with traditional media. So this data just represents the changes in behaviour over about the last five or six years um, on the most frequent mechanisms um, for collecting news information. So they really just ask people, do you use digital formats or traditional formats like print and television and radio for news? And you can see that despite the fact that this is sort of decreasing over the last few years, that um, people still go to traditional formats for collection of news information. And when you're having a breakthrough or when you do want to reach a large, large audience, news is, is, the, is absolutely still the best way to be able to do that. People still engage with news in a way which is interesting given the, the sort of style of, of news that we're seeing. Um, but even, even still, the, the, I mean, when they asked about digital formats, they're still talking about online newspapers and they're still talking about getting information from traditional sources, but they're asking, um, do you read the paper or do you, get, do you read the paper online or do you get a print version? And so we are still seeing lots of people um, engage with news. Um, and perhaps remarkably, I mean, I, I was surprised by this, but... Um, that people still trust the news as a source of information and I think that's kind of interesting too based on you know based on my own personal experience too about the kinds of things that are put in print media and the types of headlines that are that are that are sort of bandied around in terms of groundbreaking and world first and this that and the other 
um, that people still really do trust um, TV news um, as the place to go. And I don't know if that's because they see a person and they see the face and they, they have that lived experience of identifying with the person at the other end of the story. But certainly, um, to, and I guess TV news has the very, does have the best opportunity to, to highlight the real people that are involved in a story. They often use a, a person from the community in their story and perhaps that's why it's effective. But people still do believe in the news and they believe in television. So it's not a good, it's not a terrible place to put your story um, because people still will buy into the sort of the message that you're selling if you do go with traditional media. Um, but obviously we know that there is a, there is a strong movement away from, from traditional print and traditional television to the way people consume news and they do consume information online and all news sources are using social media to share news because they know social media has made a massive impact in the last decade. And so this is from that same um, Deloitte review looking at the, um, looking at the uptake and utilisation of social media and this is um, basically how many people are active in general on social media. And you can see that um, obviously trail, for those not familiar, trailing millennials are the very young people, 18 and under. Leading millennials are people from my age group, which is embarrassing to say, from 83 to uh, anyone who's about 35 that was born 18 years before the current millennials. And then obviously the others. And you can see that Facebook is massive. Um, and is a fantastic way to reach people in all age group. The matures are older than the baby boomers, so we're talking about people over 70 here. Um, and these are, you know, these are likely to be carers um, for people with dementia. They may be people with dementia. 65% of them are on social media and they're on Facebook. And so if you are thinking about engaging with people and putting messages in important places for um, ageing populations, which are kind of hard to reach with social media, with the exception of this, Facebook is a really good place to do that. Um, and I'm kind of familiar with some of the stuff that's happening on Facebook because we have a really big um, dementia and Alzheimer's group here that are very interested in um, engagement. Uh, oh, I, must have, I think I left that down a little bit further along. What was I going to say? I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, but I would say that the, the youngsters are still very much... Um, uh, using this more often. So uh, despite the fact that 65% that of, of older people or more are on social media, these are the people who identify with using it every day. It's still somewhere between 30 and 40% of people over, um, over 70 are using social media um, on a daily basis. So I think that's pretty impressive. And you know, actually it's probably pretty good for their brain using, learning all these new skills and, and using these cognitively challenging technologies. Um, although, Fair few people would argue that there's nothing cognitively challenging about social media. Um, and this just tells you a bit about what I showed you earlier, but it shows you the actual facts that people are still consuming a lot of news and a lot of information, but that there, there's a, the, I think the red line is people consuming their news on the internet. And so you can see that they're consuming less on television and radio, which is green and orange and more on the red, more on the on the internet. So they are still consuming news at about the same rate or actually even higher because they access is easier, but they um, are consuming it online, which is fine because it means that when you're consuming news online that um, often media channels will ask you, do you have a video? You know, do you have a 60 second video? And they're happy to put up a Facebook, um, happy to Facebook, happy to put up an iPhone generated um, video along with these stories these days. If you have created content or worked with your media team to create a video about exactly what you're doing or your discovery, they are very happy to put this because videos means ads and ads means money and that's how um, online news makes money these days. So there are lots of advantages to people consuming news um, online. Um, and there are lots of advantages to social media. Um, you can, the, I guess the difference between traditional media and social media is that you actually have, um, a lot of control over exactly what the message looks like. The challenge with perhaps writing a press release or negotiating a story with the media is that after you've had a conversation with them about what the story is, there's no more editing rights, there's no more opportunities to have a look over what they write or what they produce in preparation for it to go on the television or in the newspaper that you've actually lost complete control over the, the conversational narrative and, and the important parts of your story. And so if you aren't well practiced in that area, it can be really challenging. But on social media, you can actually control all of that. You can control what your message is. You can 
control who sees it because with paid advertising you have these days you have an amazing ability to target exactly who it gets in front right down to postcode and socioeconomic status and actually you know you can you you can ask um facebook to target people with dementia um the algorithms are so good these days that you or with an interest in dementia um you can target your message that um that specifically um you can have global reach as opposed as opposed to a more um local um reach that's possible with with news here in australia it's it's pretty rare to be able to get a story to go so big that it goes onto Sky News or goes onto CNN, but it's possible, but very difficult. Um, and it's still possible to go viral on social media. It's pretty well out of your control. And if you don't have like puppies in it, it's probably not super likely. Um, you know, I think one of the last videos to go viral out of South Australia was the, oh, sorry, my lights went off. Um, was the spider crawling? I mean, I don't know how many people saw it, but there was a spider that crawled into the back of a um, of a car boot not too long ago that started on social media here in Adelaide and ended up going viral all over the world. My friends were sending it to me from America and asked me, "Is this legit?" And I was like, "Yeah, unfortunately." And so it's very hard to predict what goes viral, and it's very hard to make something go viral. Um, but viral, you know, virality is still possible, and you still can get a message to to have long reach. Um, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about just a few of the platforms and which one might be best for you if you were thinking about using one of these platforms to share your message. Um, your media team at your universities and research institutes should know lots of these things, um, but surprisingly they also may not. There are, like for example, at the place that I used to work, which I won't mention, um, there are some older people in the comms team, particularly in the media team, and they're not super social media savvy and so thinking about um, some of these things might fall to you about working out where you want your message to go but I'll give you my personal email at the end and we can have a chat about it if this is something that's really important to you. So like I said earlier Facebook is actually a really good platform to reach older Australians. Um, it's really good for anyone uh, under 65 but it's super good for reaching people over 65 it's pretty much the only social media platform that will allow you to do that effectively and you can target it and what i'm sort of seeing more and more here in applications and things that i'm reviewing as through a lot of grant reviewing is that people are thinking about the communication strategy associated with their research so it's cheap to reach a lot of people um, on social media for 30 dollars um, on facebook you can reach five to 10,000 people who are interested in the thing that you want. So thinking about putting these kind of um, advertising and communications costs into grants where possible, it's not different than putting publication costs. People are starting to say, yeah, that's a, that's a smart thing to do. And it ticks a lot of boxes um, with engagement um, and impact, and it's very measurable. The other thing is that all of these social media platforms have a fantastic back end that allows you to do really high, high end analytics. And so if you do use them, you actually can, there is a lot of science behind how you can reach people and then what you can actually look at what you achieved. And so you actually can measure engagement and impact in stuff that you put up by using social media as a platform to share information, which I think is, is a space that's really growing and something that we, that my team are really thinking about here at Samri in terms of how can we give people their own information about engagement and impact um, through social media analytics, which are cheap and um, readily accessible. Hey, Hannah, we've got a question that's come in um, from Sally Ann, um, and she's wondering where LinkedIn fits in with this um, in terms of reach. Um, that's a good question. If you're trying to reach your, I know I'm not going to talk about LinkedIn today. I did have it in, I took it out because I thought. LinkedIn's super duper good if you want to reach your peers and you're well connected. If you're not active on LinkedIn, it's, um, it, it's, not, it's not super valuable. Um, and if you don't have 500 connections in your network, the algorithms on LinkedIn aren't particularly good. So if you're not busy and active on there, it's probably not a good investment of your time. It's a really good place to find a job and it's not a terrible place to find work connections. Um, but unless you're probably, if you do research in the business space or you want to reach out to businesses, it's perhaps not a bad way. Um, but I wouldn't invest loads of time in LinkedIn for anything but personal reasons. There's my personal opinion. 
Yeah. We Thank have another you. question that's come through as well, Hannah. Mm -hmm. um, it's about participant recruitment, so yeah. insights into participant recruitment. Yeah, so we actually use um, social media a lot for participant recruitment. Um, I can tell you about a recruitment that we ran last week. Um, we, you may or may not have seen it, depending on your interest in uh, sugary beverages and energy drinks. And so we spent, we put a $28 spend um, and were able to get 115 um, people to start the recruitment process and 83 people to complete the recruitment process. So, you know, I think it, if you target it appropriately, you know what you're doing, it's about 25 cents um, per recruit, which is pretty good um, for a no paper, no sort of a low waste recruitment. It's not always that successful if you want to, I mean, these were just targeting people who had displayed an interest in, um, in energy drinks. So that's easy. We've done it. Um, we do it a lot in the mothers and baby space. So um, the targeting and algorithms for people who are pregnant, for example, or have young children are very, very good. Um, and so we use it a lot there too. It's a very cheap way to advertise and recruit. For $100, you can probably recruit a couple of hundred um, people with a really savvy, um, I think what, what's key is that you have to have quite a savvy um, catch on your social media um, uh, post. So really good content's important, but there are lots of good content creators and every university should have a pretty good content creator, but happy to explore that more too. But I think it's a really good place to recruit and we recommend that people, one, include it in the ethics application because we won't run anything that people haven't got an ethics um, application for um, that says that they'll use Facebook for recruitment, um, but we do use it for recruitment a lot. We don't find Instagram as effective, but we have tried it on a couple of occasions. Yeah. And so the particular question was around culturally and linguistically diverse groups. Um, have you had any experience of um, advertising on social media for those particular groups? Um, we, I can think of one, a culturally diverse group that I, try, I tried to, we were advertising um, last year a scholarship for Indigenous students. Um, and we were able to target that down to people that were local, people that were gaining a tertiary education and people that identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, and be able to find a group of people. The challenge is that um, obviously the more, um, the more characteristics that you put in place, the smaller the group is and the more expensive it becomes to target them. But it wasn't that expensive and you certainly can use it as a way to do that. You can use culture is a pretty good way. Um, the algorithms on culture are pretty good. Yep. Thanks. Yep. I would definitely recommend it. Um, and there are lots of, actually, there are some super duper good um, YouTube videos on how to go about some of this if your media office isn't super savvy. But I would encourage you to not jump online and do it before you've at least had a chat with them. Excellent. Thanks, Anna. No worries. Um, what else about Facebook? Um, yeah, like I said, I just told you a lot about the fact that it's really good at targeting. Um, the algorithms are excellent, and that comes from the fact that there are about 2.5 billion users, um, and so they're incredibly good. There is, I mean, there's an amazing story about um, social media targeting, Facebook in particular, and Target, um, the shopping centre Target, targeting a girl with pregnancy information that didn't know she was pregnant. Um, so I don't know, if, you know, these are myths, but the targeting is very good and we use it very effectively. Um, it's a really good place to create a community and that's what I was talking about earlier and I think I was going to show that um, it's good for mixed content too. So if sometimes you think you might have a video to share and other times you might want to write a few words and you might have a picture sometimes but not always. Facebook's a really good, a really good um, place to start and I actually think it's probably the place that's most beneficial for people working um, in this space, the type of social media to reach at least community type people. Before you go on, Hannah, there is one other question. We're getting them thick and fast now. Um, uh, the question is from Danny Greaves, and she's wondering if you've heard about verbalised science and what your thoughts are around verbalised science. Yeah. Um, look, I think any opportunity you have to share your face with your message is immensely beneficial. Um, we have decided to not use verbalise.science. I love Andy Stapleton. I know him very well and I think he's a fantastic science communicator, but I don't think the portal is perfect at this point. But I do think that they understand that we do have to, in really short snippets, reach out to people and connect with them in, 
in a, in a positive way. Um, being authentic and doing that with your face is really important to telling your story, um, why, you're, why it's important to you and how you got there and why you're doing what you're doing is as important as what you're doing and what your message is. And so I encourage you to, to take opportunities to, if you're gonna create short video, to actually use your words and your face um, a bit and to showcase you and make what you do really real and authentic. And I think that that platform lacks a little bit of that right now, but I suspect that she had a long chat with Andy about it and I'm hoping to see that they might incorporate a bit more about that. And if they do, then I would definitely recommend it. But right now I think it's a bit early on to invest your dollars in. Yeah, it's just my honest um, personal opinion and not necessarily Sammy's opinion. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Hi, Rose. Um, Facebook's a huge space for dementia. For those of you not engaged in this space as a researcher, I highly recommend that you jump on a few of these groups and look at what they're doing. Lots of them will share your information freely. Um, I actually know this, I've met this guy a couple of times now who does this Dementia Down Under group. It's super active. Um, it's mostly for carers um, of people with um, de dementia and Alzheimer's. The guy who runs it um, is a carer of his father who has dementia and Alzheimer's. The group is really good and shares high quality information and he's always interested in sharing really good stuff in this space. So I encourage you to reach out to him and, and ask if you can be involved, not from a spamming purpose. If you ever use social media, for your own purposes, particularly research purposes without permission, you may get into a huge amount of trouble. I recommend you don't do that. But if you are just interested and you want to see how people feel or you do want to do some community engagement, um, this is a really good one. I follow this group. I don't work in this space, but I'm very interested in how people engage here. And, and this is a good one. But there are lots of these. You know, I just Googled um, dementia in Australia and found huge amount of them and some of them are super specific you know muslim dementia carers australia you know you can target down to to a very small group of people and you, there is you you have um, a huge capability for reach here so i definitely recommend having a look there were thousands of groups um and these people often have a good bit of time you know carers actually often have a good bit of time on their hands when they're not caring so um, i definitely recommend there Obviously, I, I don't understand what this has, if you guys have a link, a direct link with Dementia Australia, but they've got 100,000 followers. Um, that's pretty big. Like if anyone, if I could get Samri to get to 100,000, I would be get a promotion probably. Um, so I encourage you to have a look there too. They definitely share some really good stuff. Um, and if you've got created something and it's good, you should tag them in it and see if they'll share it. Um, any way that you can get your stuff in front of an audience that has 100,000 people is immensely beneficial, especially when it's free. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about Instagram because Insta people seem to love Instagram. Uh, we're, not seeing, uh, we're not seeing an immense amount um, of use in science in general, um, but it still is a really, it's a good way to sell things. So if you do want to sell something, it's not a terrible thing to do. It's really very much for um, under 40 age group, or maybe under 50, but very much under 40 age group. But you do have to have really beautiful, engaging content. Um, and it has to be fresh and it has to be thoughtful for people to engage with what you're doing there. So um, I guess the other thing is, if you do want to showcase your daily behaviour, um, obviously, what social media took away from people for a long time was conversation. Um, it was this two way, I'm listening and I'm talking thing. It was really just a lot of talking. Um, and so that's what all these, why all these platforms have given us live um, opportunities, Facebook Live, and then all of these stories is because they realized that people wanted to talk and sometimes wanted to show they were listening and that gave them a way to do that. So if you do want to showcase stuff that's happening on a daily basis, like if you want to tell people about what's happening in, in your lab, just because you think that that's important and that's an important way to reach people, that's not, Instagram might be a good way to do that. There are some quite, important, so some good um, sort of uh, scientific, not influences per se, but people that I suspect are getting given quite a lot of money to, to talk about science on, on Instagram these days. And if you were interested in that, I could give you a list of people or you could just jump on my Instagram, which is the same as my Twitter and have a look through the people that I follow. Um, Twitter, I just mentioned, um, this is a very good place to start if you're not social media savvy um, or you're just curious about what's happening, mostly because it has a very short half-life. Um, it's probably why Donald Trump, is, don't, do not quote that, but probably why he uses it most frequently because it's gone in an instant. 
Um, but it's a really good way to reach other scientists. There are a lot of scientists on Twitter. Lots of us are spending our days here um, when we should be writing grants, reviewing grants, writing papers. Um, it's a great way to reach the media. Um, pretty much every piece of news that breaks, breaks on Twitter. Um, and it breaks here because it's instant, it's short, and people can recruit, can head to a place um, very quickly when they see breaking. So it's a great place to reach out um, and tell the media about what you're doing. You can just tag them in it. Um, they're very responsive. We still use this. I mean, we use their phone number mostly these days, but we certainly use this to, to reach people that are national that we have trouble reaching. Um, and they're very, very responsive um, on Twitter. Um, and it's a good way to reach government and politicians um, on a regular basis to tell them to um, reinforce messages that are important in terms of policy and decision making, but also just to tell them what you're up to. Um, I promise you their advisors are looking at this a lot um, because they use this as a really important source of information. In fact, that's this is pretty much how they spy on each other and what everyone else is doing. So if you do want to reach any one of the scientists, media or the government politicians, policy makers, this is a good place to do it. Um, and YouTube, I mean, YouTube's important because like there's a billion people using it, uh, billions, more than a billion people using it. Um, it's really good if you've got long content, if you're creating long videos. Um, if you're creating videos at all, it's not a bad place to store and archive them. Um, and it's a good place to teach. So if you have something that you want to teach someone, and I do wonder if this, I thought that this might be relevant because I do wonder whether there are some teaching things to happen in this particular space. Um, lots of people um, go to YouTube for information. Um, not in the Alzheimer's space, but I can tell you that my brother learned to do one of those like shaves with the, um, you know, with the, with the blade. Um, he learned how to do that on himself on YouTube. He's an idiot, but he, he does use a lot of YouTube. And, and so lots of people go to YouTube to find information. Ash is laughing because she knows my brother, um, but he does use YouTube a lot and he's a good source of information for some things, not very many, but some. All right. Any questions about that? Any more questions? No, we're all quiet at the moment. All right, good. Um, and so this last little bit is really just about um, when you find them, what should you say to them? Um, like when, when you know where your audience is, does that mean that you should just bombard them with just a huge amount of shit every day? Mm, no. Nah. Um, you don't want to bore them and you don't want to drown them in information, but you certainly do want to reach them appropriately. And I thought that um, that this might, you know, that actually maybe neural coupling was probably might be a good thing to talk to um, in a group of probably neuroscientists and, and other kinds of scientists interested in the brain. But um, this fell on deaf ears when I talked about this um, with a few people not too long ago. What's more, perhaps more important to you is that there, there is really basically, I mean, this is just a paper um, it's a kind of old now, but it's about storytelling. Um, well, it's not specifically about storytelling, but it is because what it says is that if you are telling a story to someone and you're very good at telling a story, um, that the thing you're talking about, the experience of that particular thing. So if you are describing a delicious meal and there's an Italian woman named Rose in my team who talks about food endlessly. Um, and the way she describes food is uh, second to none. And when, so when she describes food, the bit of my brain that thinks about, that is actually eating and enjoying a meal lights up. And that's basically what this says is that if you are really good at communication um, and you tell a fantastic story that you can actually have, you can evoke a response that is like the person doing that thing. And I think that that's the ultimate in storytelling, but I thought that it was probably a good publication to bring up. This, I mean, this is not the only one. There are lots that, that show that this is immensely beneficial and that, that stories are key. And so we talk here at Summary a lot about storytelling. It's not, we may, we may be telling a story in three lines, but it is, you know, we talk about the components of a story. And so I've put some of this in. You guys are willing, I'm going to give these slides to Ash after. She can, she can share them within your group in a confidential way if you would like access to them. Um, but I think that some of these things are important, but I certainly don't have enough time to go into detail on the storytelling. But um, I think that this is key. Um, we are seeing a huge amount of benefit to this kind of communication in the work that we're doing here at SAMRI. Um, we are, I think, well, I know because we track our analytics, we are 600% up on where we were at the same time last year, um, just based on the fact that we are being more creative about how we um, engage 
with important scientific important scientific stories in the community. Um, and so really good stories have a defining character. That character might be you, that might be the thing you work on, that might be um, the person you're working for. It could be any one of these things, but it gives them someone something to grip onto. It has context. Scientists are super duper good at telling stories without enough context and content and losing the person before they've even started. And context is critical. If people don't know where the story begins, they certainly won't follow you to the end. And it's really, really important to think about this. Um, it has tension. Um, and those that can be created in a huge amount of ways. It can be created in telling everybody how much of a challenge the thing you're doing is. It can be talking about how severe and catastrophic these problems are to the community. It can be any one of those things. But what's really important is that you resolve that tension and climax at some point is that you find a way to make people feel really good about what's happening and you do that by telling them that you're a step closer to solving the thing that that you're working on and then action obviously you have to tell them what you're doing um, this is actually not just unique um, to a story in the media for example this is a super good way to approach a paper um, I'm writing, I, I didn't used to be a good paper writer. In fact, I found it very difficult these days. Somehow I found myself coaching people on how to write a paper. Um, and we are definitely getting comments back about how these were the most easy to read papers that they've ever um, read in the reviewers' comments, which is unheard of if it was written by me, that's for sure. But it is about how you think about your story and this is incredibly important. And we're certainly applying these things about communication to all kinds of writing, including scientific writing. And I've put a link here to, um, to this story that's told by Oprah. Um, I, I'm not a massive Oprah fan, but um, there's a video on YouTube of how she tells a story about um, how she became, um, uh, she was recruited to be part of the Colour Purple movie. Um, and I highly recommend you watch it and you, listen to her and you think about why it was that you became so engaged in the story you had no connection to and then think about how you might use some of those skills to to reach people in the future um, and for most of you i think um, here's me reading a story because i'm going to tell you a story if you aren't the consumer you're trying to reach you must engage um, you can't possibly know i cannot make this point strong enough you don't know the right way to, read, to tell the story to everyone. Um, you have to ask them if you've got it right. Um, and this is, you know, I, I actually learned this in the dementia and Alzheimer's space um, very recently. We, we have um, a consumer network a who I encourage the scientists to call a community network here because language is so important. Um, these people are not consumers, they're real people. And so how you talk about them and you engage with them is so important. So the sooner we can stop calling it consumer or stakeholder engagement and call it community or real world or any one of those things is immensely important. But we had a group of these people, actually we had a group of carers um, for people with dementia and Alzheimer's here at Samri for lunch um, because we had a group of people who did really very much lab-based discovery science. Um, and they were curious about, they wanted to talk to people with a lived experience about how they could engage with them. We didn't really even know where to start because we didn't know um, we didn't know what they could contribute, but we certainly didn't want to ask them for something that wasn't realistic or wasn't, you know, we, we said maybe they could read grants or maybe they would just like to look and see what's happening and maybe there would be some kind of two-way benefit. And then I heard something at this meeting that I could never have imagined and, and one guy got up and said, he said, I don't care what your um, what you're doing in terms of early um, identification and I don't really care if you're designing markers that will help me identify if someone has it earlier because there's nothing you can do to treat it. Um, and I think everyone in the room really just about gasped. You know, they, they realised that despite the fact that they were working towards something that they thought was hugely important, you know, they were genetic, they're working on genetic determinants and um, and biomarkers and identify early identifiers that these people didn't it didn't it didn't match with their what they needed to hear about you know they it wasn't a solution for them right now and in fact they you know these people are quite you know they're quite experienced community members and it it didn't resonate with where, where they were at and where they knew the field of dementia and Alzheimer's was at so you know, engaging with these people at every opportunity is hugely important. I can't encourage you to do it enough and I can't encourage you to do it carefully enough. 
um, please proceed only with extreme caution in terms of the language you use and the type of hope you give and be honest and authentic and it will all be okay, I think. I know it will be. Um, and your communication and marketing team should be able to help. And we're back to that audience thing. Um, we sort of have done full circle, but um, you should engage with your marketing and communications team and your media team and do it today. Don't wait until you've got something to tell them. Um, th then you only got a few days turnaround. Um, engage with them now. Start having, start having a think about what your next message looks like. You don't even actually have to have a discovery. Um, I know the media, you, people will tell you that the media only want to hear about today's stories. Not true. If you've got something that's really important that needs to get out there, the media will tell your story any day. You just have to encourage your media team to reach out and, and do that. Um, and so, you know, talk to them about it today. Um, start practicing, testing and refining your message. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that you've got them all right. Um, and really think openly about who the right target audience is and who you're speaking to. It's not always the same person, um, as I mentioned, and you need to think about about who will benefit the most from your message and, and start there. So that's just a few tips, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Here's some details on how you can get me. I'm happy for you to email my personal email, that's fine. Um, and if you do have specific questions um, or grab me on Twitter, I think my Twitter details were up earlier, but Ash tweeted them today. So you can jump on Twitter and see them today and you can catch up with me there too. Yeah, that's fantastic, Hannah. Um, I do actually have a number of questions for you. Um, my first question is, um, how do you successfully manage slash balance your work life when your science story is getting a lot of media attention? <laughs> um, you drop everything for 24 hours um, and you have to be prepared to do that. So if you do want to engage and you do want people to hear your story, you have to be prepared to just put everything down for 24 hours to do breakfast radio, to do television in the middle of the day, to write a piece for the conversation in 24 hours, to do nightly news, to um, be on radio for the next, community radio for the next three days. Um, if you want people to hear about what you do, you just have to prioritise it, but it doesn't last long. You know, the... The thing about today's news being lining, you know, Notting Hill lining tomorrow's waste paper baskets, it's really true. Like, um, if you have a massive story one day, people stop calling by like 4 p.m. Um, so you just have to put it down and you have to not panic when you've got heaps on. You just have to plan so that you don't have anything on that day. You don't want to be travelling. You don't want to be away. You just want to be present for 24 hours so that you can tell everyone what you're doing so you can cover as many media outlets as possible and then go back to your normal life the next day. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I have another question as well, if that's okay. And if anyone else has questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, we've still got another five, seven minutes or so. So um, yeah, absolutely add, add your questions to the chat. But the question I would like to ask is, have you ever been faced with a situation where your science story has been lost in translation? Um, so for example, your audience misinterpret your science, and then and how do you deal with this? How do you rectify that situation? Yeah, um, uh, it's hard. Uh, it will happen. It will happen to everyone. Um, you can't, no matter how prepared you are uh, and how many times you've done this, someone will mishear something important to you. Um, and for example, you might find yourself a little like me, um, curing infertility on the front page of the advertiser, which is the local paper here in South Australia, three times in one year, um, which I mean, it's good to be on the front page of the advertiser. It's not so good to be curing infertility, which I absolutely didn't do. Um, I also got asked on the project um, whether I had just designed something that meant people could be parents, um, at, women could start families at 50 and 60. Um, so it doesn't matter how good your story is. Um, people will let, I've been asked lots of questions. I do, have done lots of work on um, genetic editing and I've been asked endless questions about zombies um, on live radio and television. Um, there, you can't be too well prepared, too well prepared to try and deal with those things. And the key is to, if you are on television or radio and you have an opportunity to keep speaking, go back to what your original message was. 
um, and sort of nail back on the thing that's really important. And if it's in print, try not to worry about it. Um, occasionally things get printed that are really inaccurate. Um, actually, the, the Age came out yesterday and, and printed an article about the fact that they are only going to fact check and, and print stuff that's really right. I don't know if that means that they're going to ask journalists to go back and have scientists check their stuff. But what you can do is ask. Um, you can definitely say, if I promise to get this back to you in 15 minutes, will you show me the final, um, the final piece? This doesn't give you an opportunity to edit it ever. You don't get to edit a journalist's work, but you might be able to say there's a huge glaring mistake. They don't want to print a mistake. Um, and so you might get a chance. And that, I guess that comes from practice too and becoming a trusted source, you know, building a relationship with the media, going to the same person each time, um, learning to communicate appropriately with them and having them trust you is um, a good step in the right direction. And then it means that maybe, maybe they'll get better at it. Um, they do get better. We are trying to train them here at Samri, but that, that relies on my media manager, Pete, having an amazing relationship with them. And it's going okay, but it, it's practice um, and it's relationship building mostly. So I have a question from Lynn, um, and she's asking, how do you advise people to track their media coverage and exposure? So what types of examples can we use in relation to writing our impact statements? So I promise you that your university tracks all of this. They know every time that you, your institution, they know every time you've done anything. So you should ask them for a free analysis at any time. You shouldn't ask them a lot, but you should say, you should certainly when it's coming up to grant time, I highly recommend that you reach out to your media team at your organization and say, Hey, can you tell me what my reach has been over the last, um, the last 12 months? And they will be able to provide that for you for free. Um, they might not be super keen, but if you could just say, hey, if you could provide me that I sent you a report that tells me how much influence and value I've added over the last 12 months, um, you can totally do that. Um, also, I mean, I don't know if people know, but you can certainly look at your own social media growth by using analytics too. So you can go onto the back end of your own social media. Certainly um, Twitter has a really good um, analytics um, analytics um, system for your own personal social media so you can track your own growth and reach just by if you open twitter in a web window and then in the next um google twitter analytics is the best um, this will be the best way for you all to find it google twitter analytics click on the button um, and it will bring up your personal analytics for your twitter so you can track your own behavior too and you can see you know down to you can download every post and look at how many people looked at it what the most popular words are why some you know you can look at who you're reaching all of those things are available so um you can do a bit yourself but actually your university track all the big stuff so ask them yeah no, that's great advice and i've certainly used um the media team for that as well it's excellent for grants yeah um so i've got a question for you hannah um one last question from me and then if anyone else has questions please feel free to add them now um, do you personally have a daily social media routine and what works for you? Um, I guess my routine these days is probably different to my routine as a scientist. And these days, the first thing I do is look on the summary social media to make sure someone hasn't said a bad word. Um, and although you can absolutely set um, parameters to stop people from using bad words on your social media if you would like, and it's very um, good if you have, like, for example, a lab you run social media for a lab or a group, um, you actually can monitor and make sure that you censor stuff that does get posted. And I do recommend you do that if you have that kind of group. Um, but I guess my sort of my routine behavior is that I create a lot of lists on Twitter so I can see things in a hurry. And I always have a scout for interesting things that are happening. Um, but I guess my best even better than any one of these things is I think that as important as it is to talk about your own story, it's really, really um, important to contribute to science conversation in a positive way all the time. And so if you drive to work or catch the bus or whatever, and you listen to ABC radio, um, I promise you that in the new, in the first news, um, like the 6.30 news or the 7 o'clock news, or the 7.45 news on ABC, they cover everything big that happens for the day. And everything that happens there, from, from there, every other news story that happens for the day is derived. And so, for example, this morning, um, I went on and I, the, there was a story about um, the cost of, that doctors are charging for, um, for uh, 
procedures um, and how people are not being able to afford them. Um, and we don't have someone who's an expert on that here at Samri, but we do have someone who's very passionate about it, a guy, a gastroenterologist who believes that all healthcare should be free. And so I heard the news and I was like, hey, that guy's a really good advocate for this. Maybe the radio will want to talk to him. So I just called the radio and said, hey, do you want to talk to this guy today? And they said, of course. Um, and so you should listen to the early news or you should check the breaking news on social media first thing in the morning and see if there's anything that links to you. And when there is, you should write back to that news source. If, you know, if you're on Twitter and someone's tweeted about something, write back and say, hey, I'm an expert on that thing. Do you want to talk to me later? Um, they will write back. These people are dying to find great experts. Um, and I promise you that if you engage with people in this way, um, when stuff's fresh, when stuff's hot, they'll write back. Um, they'll say, yeah, we would love to talk to you about that. And a good way to start talking about science um, and to get practice in the media uh, is to talk about other people's stuff where you're an expert, but you don't have to worry about saying the wrong thing. Where you just say, yeah, this is really important. Dementia is a huge issue. La, 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 la. Um, but you don't have to worry about getting your own message wrong. You can just be, you can just contribute to a really positive story with facts in a way that's, that where you're trustworthy and, and that contributes to, a, um, in, contributes to the, the, the narrative around whatever's happening. And so I definitely encourage you to do that. Look at what's happening for the day and do that. Um, but if you are on Twitter and you want to tell people what you're doing, try and make it regular. Um, don't make it too regular on Facebook. People get bored. Um, and mix it up across platforms. Try not to post the same shit on all of your platforms. If you're talking about science, if you're doing personal stuff, probably no one cares, but <laughs> if you're talking science, don't pl don't post the same stuff on all the platforms because people will get sick and the algorithms will know and they'll just not show you show other people anything. So, yeah. Some really, really great tips, Hannah. Um, yeah. I think we're almost at time. So I'd just like to thank you um, immensely for the information that you've shared today. It's I've learnt, certainly learnt a lot. No worries. Excellent. So I'll um, sign everyone out and end the meeting now. So thank you everyone for attending and I'll see you all later. Awesome. Bye. Bye.